Welcome to Zoom In, Zoom Out, your global look at news from Taiwan. I'm Chris Gorin. Taiwan chip giant TSMC now turns out more than 90% of the world's most advanced chips, the silicon running our smartphones, and the data centers powering the AI boom. But this lead wasn't always a sure thing. For years, it was the American company Intel that dominated chip manufacturing and design. After a rough decade, the company is trying to make its way back to the top with a new CEO leading the charge. As AI and chips take center stage in geopolitics, the fate of Intel matters more than ever. Joining me today to discuss this pivotal moment in the industry is Bob O'Donnell from the tech research firm Technalysis. Bob has been covering the semiconductor industry for decades and often shares his insights with global news outlets. So Bob, thank you so much for joining the show today. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Let's set the scene here. As I mentioned, Intel was once the king of the chip world, but they now clearly lag behind their competitors like TSMC. Uh, some are even saying that their most recent leadership change is their last chance to turn things around, that they're on their last legs. How did we get to this point? First of all, just to be clear, I don't think Intel's on their last legs, but they're clearly not at the level that they used to be. I mean, look, this is a 50-year-old company that dominated the semiconductor market for over 40 plus of those years. So what we've seen over the last several years, and frankly, the last decade, honestly, is this situation where TSMC slowly but surely caught up and then surpassed Intel in terms of their manufacturing capabilities and what have you. Plus, we saw the explosion of things like mobile phones and other devices that demanded chips, and Intel wasn't making chips for others uh, at that time. And TSMC, of course, was making chips for people like Apple and Qualcomm, NVIDIA. And so you have a whole combination of factors. First, we saw Intel struggled with some of their process technologies around 10 nanometer or so. They really ran into some issues. And TSMC made more incremental gains and over time simply surpassed Intel and took advantage of the market situation whereby everybody wanted to take advantage of TSMC's advanced technologies. And the markets that required those chips just grew exponentially. So all of those pieces came together, and now we are where we are, where Intel, of course, is trying to build up its own foundry business in addition to building chips for itself, which has been the vast, vast majority of its manufacturing uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, and TSMC, in, in the meantime, of course, is expanding its footprint, uh, building factories outside of Taiwan, expanding its reach even further. While the PC market's still big, there's so many other bigger markets now, uh, smartphones in particular, as well as lots of other capabilities, AI accelerators and GPUs from NVIDIA, for example. All of these things have become incredibly important, and TSMC has gotten to the point where really they're kind of the only one that can do these advanced chips. I mean, you know, 90 plus percent of those really advanced nodes are, are being built by TSMC. Yeah, and just to underline that point, uh, Intel's most recent AI chip, the Gaudi 3, isn't even being made by Intel itself. It's being produced by TSMC using their 5 nanometer process. That's true, by the way, of also Intel's Lunar Lake, their latest PC chip, which has been uh, actually very well received, and even some future generations. I mean, look, all this stuff in the semiconductor business, you have to remember, takes years and years. None of this stuff changes overnight. So some of these things were set in motion years ago. And again, that's why I pointed back to almost 10 years ago as sort of the beginning of how this change has happened. And oh, by the way, it also means it's going to be years and years before there's any significant change that we start to notice in a reverse direction, if indeed that does start to happen and Intel starts to gain more share. So all of this has led to a change of leadership at Intel, with their former CEO, Pat Gelsinger, being forced out last December, and new CEO, Lip Bhutan, taking over in March. So who is Lip Bhutan, and what does he bring to the table? Well, Lip Bhutan comes to the job with a really unique set of skills and capabilities. He's been in the semiconductor business for many decades in various roles. He's originally from Malaysia, grew up in Singapore, knows a lot of the Chinese chip companies as well as the TSMC and all the folks in Taiwan. And his last job was as the CEO of Cadence. Cadence 
makes what's called EDA software, uh, electronic design automation. Basically, it's the software that companies use to design their own chips and then send those to the manufacturing facilities. So he understands the process of chip design. He understands the process of interacting with chip manufacturers. He's got these skill set. He's got connections all over the world, and he's willing to make some difficult decisions. I think ultimately what cost Gelsinger his job, because he had a great vision, but my understanding is there were a lot of other issues internally that you know none of us ever see or really hear about, but that were causing problems. And one of them in particular was the size of the company, and that was a big issue. So one of the first things Lipu has done is come in and said, look, it's gonna be tough. So with Lipu Tan now in charge, where specifically is Intel still falling short compared to its competitors like TSMC? Well, look, I mean, the biggest issue is they have to build up a uh, trust in other companies using them because Intel's manufacturing was so closely aligned and tightly aligned with its own products. You know, there's a concern that if I'm a competitor, if I'm an AMD or if I'm an, you know, that you were making modems as well. If I'm a Qualcomm, if I'm one of these other companies that competed with Intel, now all of a sudden, you know, I'm, you're asking me to give them my design. You know, there's a little bit of a trust issue you have to overcome. So First things first is they're clearly separating the two companies to make it very clear to potential customers that there's a, you know, there's a firewall in between these two businesses and anything you share with the foundry side is never going to make to the product side. They're also working on catching up in terms of just process nodes, right? So they've announced 18A coming later this year at the same time TSMC is expected to have two nanometer, which is basically, you know, 20A or 2.08, depending on how you, it's all just uh, naming, but they're all very close. And there's some key technologies. Um, there's uh, ribbon FET transistors, or they're also called gate all around. It's a new transistor technology that's more power efficient and designed for finer pitches, which is, you know, the size of the transistors they can make. And each of the companies is doing that, but Intel had to play catch up to get there. The one advantage that I think Intel has is uh, they've really done a lot with regards to packaging technology. That is the combination of multiple chips, sometimes from different vendors. And the combination of those different pieces, the packaging as it's called, is really important. And that's a key area that Intel thinks they can make a difference with. Well, let's take a look at where their tech is now. Both TSMC and Intel have their most advanced processes at around two nanometers. How do they stack up against each other? Well, you know, look, it's still early. None of these chips have shipped, so no one knows for sure. Uh, but speculation is that they're going to be relatively similar. That's not going to be the deciding factor here, right? Much, much, much bigger issues are going to be around diversified supply chain. Because with what's going on between China threatening Taiwan, if God forbid there was some sort of blockade of Taiwan, the semiconductor business is in enormous trouble because so many of these chips are being made by TSMC. And if you look at any market around the world, it doesn't matter what it is, what industry, to have one company have that much control is usually never a great thing for the long run and for competition but particularly now for supply chains. And we learned this lesson in the pandemic. You know, and Taiwan's also on the ring of fire. I mean, you guys get earthquakes all the time. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast as well. So there's a lot of reasons why you wanna have a supply chain for something as critical as semiconductors that is geographically diverse. Turning now to the most demanding industry for chips, AI. There's a big debate about what the main bottleneck for that industry will be. Intel's new Gaudi 3 AI chip, for example, it's more about energy efficiency than raw compute power. There are only so many data centers you can build, after all, before you run out of electricity. So in the next five years or so, you know, what do you think the main bottleneck is? Is it raw compute power or electric power? Uh, you know, I think five years out, it's definitely going to be electricity. Uh, right now, it's still compute, and that's where the focus is. But, you know, we're talking about these gigawatt data centers all over the U.S. We've already had situations in the U.S. where, you know, certain states and places where people want to install these, they're saying no because they can't ensure that the power grid in that area can necessarily handle all the power demands that these data centers 
are, are going to create. And so that in turn falls back on the chips. I mean, again, as powerful as Nvidia's chips are, and they are incredibly powerful, they're also unbelievably power hungry. I think you are going to see a lot more focus on that. We've seen AMD focus on this in addition to Intel. We've seen a, a lot of other startups talk about trying to do AI accelerators that are more power efficient. And we've also seen changes in how the models are written and how they're running. Of course, DeepSeek being an example. Again, energy grids can't be turned on overnight. I mean, these things take a long time to install and to beef up. Um, and so that's a, a very real world issue. So the notion of getting to more power efficient designs uh, is critical. When it comes to Intel, what's the government's role? Obviously, the US has the CHIPS Act, which is giving billions of US dollars to both Intel and TSMC. Is that enough? Does Intel, with market power alone, stand a chance of catching up to or surpassing TSMC? All right, let me tear that apart a couple different ways. First of all, Intel has gotten to where they are, which is fairly competitive on a technology basis, without a single dollar of the CHIPS Act. They have yet to receive, or if they did receive, they just got some of the CHIPS Act money. Most of it they haven't gotten at all. The issue is moving forward. So I think technologically they've been able to catch up. The question will be, will those additional funds help them to build out the factories they need and do the other things they're going to want to be able to do? And sure, that's going to help. The other thing is Intel's not going to take over 50% of the advanced chip market from you know its position of having a few percentage versus 90% versus TMC. We, you know, we're talking about, hey, in a great scenario is instead of TSMC having 90%, they have 80% and then Intel has 20%, right? I mean, that's the kind of change or maybe 25%, whatever it is. I mean, and that even would take many, many years, if not a decade. Well, one place that is getting a lot of government support is China. They have a long-term strategy to become self-sufficient in AI hardware, in part due to U.S. export controls. Uh, they say they want to leapfrog Taiwan and the U.S. technologically. Is this a realistic goal? First of all, honestly, probably not. I think there's so many challenges for China to try and overcome them. You know, the, the big technology change that we are in the midst of that both Intel and TSMC are embracing is EUV or extreme ultraviolet lithography. That's the ability to write super small lines on each of these silicon chips. And EUV machines are made by ASML out of the Netherlands. And of course, they are also being prevented from shipping some of those advanced machines to China. So without that, China has to resort to technologies that frankly, we're at the heart of Intel's problems. They tried to do double patterning using older technologies uh, to get these finer lines. And that proved to be extremely difficult. Thank you, Bob. I think this has been really helpful for people trying to understand these companies. So uh, to wrap up, what do you think our viewers should be looking to for the next couple of years in the semiconductor space? Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's a great conversation. I, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic. Um, and there's just, you know, there's so much going on uh, in this business. And, and again, it, as, I, as I said, it's so critical because everything that we use and, and are involved with our lives practically has got some kind of chip in it. And so, and that's just going to continue to grow. By the way, let's not forget five, 10 years from now, we may also have quantum computers. Now, they're not, quantum are different. They're not going to replace traditional computers, but yet another set of interesting technologies that open up some interesting opportunities you know, opportunities. So it's, it's a very exciting field. I, you know, I love thinking about it, talking about it, you know, working in this business. The good news is, as somebody who's tracked it for a long time, trying to have this kind of a conversation, even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, would have been impossible because nobody knew or cared about semiconductors and about chips. Now everybody does. And so because of that, it's going to continue to be a much stronger focus for governments, uh, for average people and, and for businesses of all type around the world. So it's going to be fun to watch, that's for sure. Well, it's certainly been fun to talk to you about it. So thanks again, Bob. Thanks, Chris. This has been Zoom In, Zoom Out. You can find more stories from Taiwan Plus News by following us on social media. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>